Okay, uh, so let's get started. So today I want to talk about uh, uh, today I want to talk about refinements of Nash equilibrium. And I want to start with an example. Uh, you know, even though I am talking about refinement of uh, Nash equilibria, uh, you might think that this topic is not very important, uh, but it turns out that uh, one of the algorithms for rank 1 games, rank 1 non-zero sum games was actually found using some ideas from this entire theory which is a very purely academic theory. It has no, I mean I, I don't want to say that it has no applications in real life but it's not really useful from an engineering perspective. All it does is it says which equilibrium is more likely to appear in real life than other equilibrium. Uh, but. Uh, Maybe, maybe it's useful for that, but as far as computational tools are concerned, uh, I found one paper that uses this idea of uh, uh, refinement to come up with an algorithm that can exactly tell you what the Nash equilibrium of a class of game should be. Okay, So it may have some algorithmic significance in the future, uh, but that's a research problem. Okay, That's not something that we know upfront whether this is useful or not. So that's why uh, uh, don't think of it as a purely academic class. Maybe one of you will be able to develop a new e algorithm for computing Nash equilibria based on the idea that we are discussing in today's class. Maybe, okay, maybe not, who knows. It's research. Uh, so the first thing I want to introduce is the best response. Uh, well, let's start with an example, okay? The example is, I have a non-zero sum game where payoff matrix, uh, the cost matrix, so this is cost, the cost matrices of both the players are the same. Okay. Is there a weakly dominated strategy here? Okay, so there is. So this is a weakly dominated strategy because the first row is always less than equal to the second row. If it was strictly less than the second row, if it was 0 0.5 or 0 0.9, then this was a dominated strategy. But because it's equal to 1, it becomes a weakly dominated strategy. So there are two pure strategy Nash equilibria in this P, S, N, E. What are they? L R L1 R1 and L2 R2 these are cost matrices so L1 L2 and R1 R2 these are the two uh, pure strategy Nash equilibria in this particular um, game so can everyone see why that's the case so let's see if first player sticks to L1, right? Oh, sorry. This should be L1, R1, and this should be L2, R2, right? So player two chooses column, player one chooses rows. So if player one chooses L1, then it's L. If player one chooses L1, then L2 is the best response for player two. If player two chooses L2, then player then L1 is the best response for player one, right? So this is an equilibrium and same thing for R1, R2, 2. Okay, so this is a, uh, this is a non zero sum game where we have two equilibria and the question is which of them It's a non zero sum game. Yeah, it's a non zero sum game where the payoff matrices are equal. Which of the two Nash equilibria is likely 
to be played. L1, L2. <laughs> Anyone who thinks that R1, R2 will be played in real life? No. Uh, okay. So L1, L2 is uh, is true, uh, but there's a reason for that. How would you argue? Because as far as equilibrium is concerned, what Nash says is any of these two is plausible. Okay. So this is post 1951. So we are in 1975. Okay. So this is 19. 75, Nash proposed that these two are equilibrium and uh, that was 1951, so 20 years have, 25, 24 years have passed since then and now you are asking this question, well, you know, there is some problem with R1, R2, okay, even though it's an equilibrium, there is some problem, but what is the problem? How do we, how do we rule out using a rigorous mathematical principle? How can we rule out that this is not an equilibrium that will be played in this particular game? Yeah? Maybe we should find the minimum value, uh, minimum cost among uh, all the national points. Uh, no, because that would require you to coordinate. I mean, if, if you make this a general principle, then it requires coordination of the two players. These players are non-cooperative. They are not going to cooperate with each other. No, that's again requires cooperation. Okay, nothing that is cooperative. Okay, or it's better for him to play L1 rather than R2. So player one will always go to L1, and as a result, player two will go to L2. No, you are you are just reiterating the definition of Nash equilibrium. That's not that's not really a mathematical principle. <laughs> Where did you read that answer? Did did you come up with that answer right now? Yes. Oh wow! <laughs> if you had come up with that answer in 1974, you would have received a Nobel Prize by now. <laughs> so uh, this was proposed by Selton. The idea is correct. So what his idea is? Remember that when I mentioned Nash equilibria, what I mentioned was Nash equilibrium is really equilibrium in beliefs. What I believe you are going to play, and what you believe I am going to play. Okay. So, when I say L1, L2 is a Nash equilibrium, if I am player 1, I believe that you are going to play L2, okay, which is why I will play L1, and you, what you believe is I am going to play L1, and which is why you will play L2, and same thing goes for R1, R2. Right? So, what he is suggesting, and what actually Selton, in one of his fam famous papers, suggested, that guess what, I am going to believe that you will play L1, so, so if I am player 1, I am going to believe that you will play L2 with probability 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon is a very small positive number, but you might play R2 with a positive epsilon. Okay. So Selton said that I am going to consider sigma, uh, okay, so so P star, uh, so let's say I want to look at this equilibrium, P star equal to 1, 0 and Q star equal to 1, 0. So what Selton suggested is let's consider sigma 1 as 1 minus epsilon epsilon and sigma 2 which is 1 minus epsilon epsilon, okay. So what is this? What does this suggest? What it's suggesting is when I'm playing the game, my hands are going to tremble. Okay, so instead of picking L1, which I'm supposed to do with probability 1, my hands are going to tremble with some small probability and I'm going to pick L2, no, R, so I'm going to pick R1 with some small positive probability. Okay, so this is known as trembling hand. Okay, 
and what we need to prove is Uh, so this is the definition of perfect equilibrium. Where what we need to prove is P star is the best response. So it minimizes, uh, yeah, minimizes P in delta M, P transpose A sigma 2 and Q star should minimize Q in delta N sigma 1 transpose B Q, okay. So if that holds true, then P star Q star then and epsilon is strictly greater than 0, then P star Q star is a perfect equilibrium. I mean you lost a Nobel Prize just because you were born at the wrong time, I'm feeling sorry for you. <laughs> okay, so uh, So does this does this hold true? Does this hold true? So let's look at it. Uh, what is a sigma two? That's zero one 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 minus epsilon and epsilon. One minus and then one. Right. So what's the What's the argument? Oh, this should be argument, right? Argument. Okay, this sh there should be an argument here. We're not really looking at the min, we are looking at the argument. Okay, so P star minimizes this, right? P star transpose epsilon 1 is actually the minimum. So this equation holds. Let's look at sigma 1 transpose B sigma 1 transpose B, that's equal to 1 minus epsilon, epsilon, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 minus epsilon and epsilon. No. Epsilon, 1 minus epsilon. Right? So again, Q star, which is 1, 0, minimizes this. Right? So therefore, P star, Q star that I've mentioned is a perfect equilibrium. It's a perfect equilibrium. And then, this is the equilibrium, which is corresponding to this P star, Q star. This is the equilibrium that will be played often, or that will be played most of the time. Okay? Because why would this be played most of the time? Because I, as one player in this game, I'm going to assume that your hands are going to tremble. So you're going to pick some other action with a positive, very small positive probability. And I want to minimize my cost, expected cost, by choosing an appropriate equilibrium. Okay? So L1, L2 satisfies that equilibrium. If you look at, if you go through the same exercise and change this to, 0, 1, 0, 1, and this to epsilon 1 minus epsilon and epsilon 1 minus epsilon, okay? So this is the trembling hand corresponding to this equilibrium. Uh, you will see that this relationship is not satisfied. This is epsilon and this is 1 minus epsilon. Oh, of course. This should be 1. Yeah, epsilon and 1. Okay, I was just checking whether you guys are awake or <laughs> asleep. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, so that's the idea behind perfect equilibrium. Okay, 
or also called trembling hand equilibrium. Any question? Yeah. So if, if sigma 1 and sigma 2 are like this, right. P star and Q star, we get that. So let's, let's do that. Let's do that. What is A sigma 2? Epsilon 1 minus epsilon. So that's 1 minus epsilon, and that's 1. Right? OK. So P star which is 0, 1, is not a best response. Okay, Same thing will happen for the second player also. So P star is not a best response. Not a best response, not a best response. Therefore, it's not a perfect equilibrium. Okay, So what's the rigorous definition of perfect equilibrium? This is a hand wavy definition. I want to make it more rigorous. So let's say you have n players and pi star is a Nash equilibrium, i equals 1 to n. So, so we say that p1 star, pn star is a perfect equilibrium if and only if there exist sigma 1 k sigma n k k equals 1 to infinity k equals 1 to infinity such that sigma 1 k is in the interior of delta a uh, delta 1 okay so delta 1 is the simplex for the corresponding to the actions of player 1 okay so delta so sigma i k i or set of distribution okay so i want each of these sigma 1k to be in the interior all of you are familiar with the interior of a set okay what is the interior of a set interior of a set is interior of a set C is the smallest no largest open set largest open set inside C okay so in the case of in the case of a simplex interior of delta i is a uh, so if sigma ik is in the interior of this set it means that every element of sigma ik is positive so this also means every element in the vector is strictly greater than 0 Okay, remember this is a probability vector. Okay, so they have to add up to one, but every element has to be strictly positive. Then sigma i k converges to p i star. So this is requirement number one. This is requirement number two, and the requirement number three is that p i star 
should be argument of over all p in delta i of the cost of player i such that other players are playing their trembling hand vectors and you are playing p. Okay, so I am using C i to represent the cost function of player i. So, C i is cost function ok. So, is that is that clear? So, in this particular game this is the perfect equilibrium. Okay, so let's do a case study and I want to change the cost matrix to the following matrix A equals to B equals to 0, 1, 1, 1. So that's exactly the same as what it was before. But now I'm going to add some obscene number 8, 8, 8, 8, 10. Okay, some very large cost to both the players. So I have given those two players additional action where they will incur a very high cost. In this case, so let me L, L2, M2, R2, L1, M1, R1. So the set of So, P S N E is, you know, let me change this to something else. Let me change this to 7, okay. So, I have P S N E which is L1, L2, M1, M2, R1, R2, okay. So, all these three diagonal terms are in equilibrium. What about perfect equilibrium? Which of them are perfect equilibrium? So, L1, L2 remains a perfect equilibrium for this particular game. But it so turns out that M1 and M2 is also a perfect equilibrium of this particular game. Go through the same analysis and you will realize that L M1, M2 is also a perfect equilibrium of this game. Do you think it is a desirable property of an equilibrium? What have I done here? I have added a strictly dominated row, right, and a strictly dominated, well, it won't be a strictly dominated, okay, so let me add, make it 8. So now it becomes a weakly dominated, okay. So I have added a weakly dominated row and a weakly dominated column, okay. And I increased the number of perfect equilibria of this particular game, right. 
So in the earlier case, L1, L2 was the only perfect equilibrium. Now M1, M2 is an additional perfect equilibrium, right? And the reason for that is because these numbers are really large. So you can always come up with more perfect equilibrium that wasn't present in the original game that you started with. So that's not a desirable property of a refinement of Nash equilibria. It doesn't seem intuitive that an equilibrium should, should change uh, an equilibrium should change if we add dominated or weakly dominated strategies to the original game. So what do you think should we do? Okay, Do you have another Nobel Prize winning idea or <laughs> are you all <laughs> out of it? Okay, so what should we do? What should we do now? So now we have moved from 75 to 1978. Okay, so three years have passed since Selton defined his uh, brilliant idea of refining the set of equilibria. Okay, three years have passed and now you realize that, well, that equilibrium concept has this problem. That adding some sort of weakly dominated rows and columns or strictly dominated rows and columns changes the set of perfect equilibria. So, Meyerson came up with this idea, who is another Nobel Prize winner, but uh, not for not for proposing this proper equilibrium. Proper equilibrium. Sorry. Can you be a bit louder? Some matrices, oh, sub, sub. sub matrices. Okay, so his. Okay, so now you are doing all the combinations of possible sub matrices. Uh, that's. I, I don't want to do that. I mean, that's blowing up the. If you have three games, you have three factorial cross three factorial. You know, and sub matrices is not a good idea because, uh, in this case, of course, there are weakly dominated strategies. So you can look at sub matrix and say, well, you know, just remove all the weakly dominated strategies, but. Not every game will have weakly dominated strategies, so looking at some matrices doesn't really preserve the set of Nash equilibria. Okay, so looking at some matrices doesn't really work here. Uh, so let's look at. So there is another idea that Myerson proposed, and what he said is, well, I'm going to look at this Nash equilibrium, p star equals to. 1 0 0 and Q star equals to 1 0 0 okay and remember in this game I defined my Sigma 1 star in the previous game I had defined my Sigma 1 star as 1 minus 2 epsilon epsilon and epsilon right and Sigma 2 star was defined, not star, there is no star here. Uh, 1 minus 2 epsilon, epsilon, epsilon. Okay, this was, this was in perfect, perfect equilibrium. So what Meyerson says is, we know that even if we are, uh, Let's let's look at what Meyerson says. Okay, uh, I should I delete it? Yeah, I think I should delete it. I'll rewrite it again when I'm giving the rigorous definition. So let me consider, uh, for the time being, let me consider this strategy, uh, p star equals z epsilon, 1 minus 2 epsilon, and epsilon, okay, and no, this is not p star, sorry, p star is 0, 1, 0, q star is 
0, 1, 0. And sigma 1 is epsilon 1 minus 2 epsilon, epsilon. Sigma 2 is epsilon, 1 minus 2 epsilon, epsilon. Okay, so in perfect equilibrium, we would look at the best response corresponding to this strategy and we would look at the best response corresponding to this, this strategy. Okay, and the problem here is, if the other, if you believe that the second player is going to act according to this strategy, you know that this mistake is much likely to be, is, is higher cost to player 2 than, so this is player 2. So if he plays according to R2, it is go, the player, player 2 is going to incur a higher cost than if he acts according to L2 or M2. Okay, so what you are going to assume in proper equilibrium is since this is a more costly action, the mistake, the probability is going to be epsilon square. Okay, so it will be less than, it has to be an order of magnitude less than the probability of making a mistake which is uh, which is less costly, okay. So to, to put it uh, formally, probability of picking bad action is equal to epsilon times probability of picking the next bad action. Okay, so what, uh, again epsilon is strictly positive and epsilon is a small number. So what is happening here? So what Selton said in perfect equilibrium is if you are asked to drive at 40 miles an hour with equal probability, you can drive at 30 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, 80, 90 and 100 miles an hour. Okay, with equal probability. What, what Meyerson is saying that if you, if you have to drive at 40 miles an hour, you will say 30 and 50 are equally bad, so you will choose those actions with probability epsilon, but 60 is even worse than 50, so we'll choose that with epsilon square, and 70 miles an hour is even worse than 60, so you will choose that action with probability epsilon cube, and so on. So as you look at the worse actions, the probability of making a mistake for those actions is going to be much less, order of magnitude less, then the probability of choosing the, the next bad action. Okay, so that's, and then as you take epsilon going to zero, you will see what is known as proper equilibrium. And proper equilibrium is a strict subset of perfect equilibrium. Not a strict, but it's a subset of perfect equilibrium. So in that case, M, M1, M2 will, so in perfect, so in proper equilibrium, L1, L2 is the only proper equilibrium in that game, okay? So M1, M2 is not, no more a proper equilibrium. The reason is you pick the worst action with a very small probability as compared to picking the next worst action. Yeah. So, do the elements of they have to add up to one. So in this case, it will be 1 minus epsilon minus epsilon square, 1 minus epsilon minus epsilon square. And I don't understand why you change the, the location of the 1 to the second the element in the equilibrium, P star and Q star. Oh, so, 
So what I was, uh, you're saying that why do we have 0, 1, 0 here and 1, 0, 0 there? Yeah, no. Yeah, so if we pick L1 and L2, which is this, and if we pick sigma 1 and sigma 2 according to 1 minus epsilon minus epsilon square, 1 minus epsilon minus epsilon square, then you will see that P star is the best response to sigma 2 and Q star is the best response to sigma 1. In this case, P star is not a best response to sigma 2. Okay, and Q star is not a best response to sigma 1. Therefore, it's not a proper equilibrium. I mean, M1, M2, so this is not a proper equilibrium. Not a proper equilibrium. Okay, so costly mistakes occur with very low probability. Less costly mistakes occur with epsilon probability and the rest of it should just be made so that it adds up to 1. Okay, so what's the uh, definition of uh, proper uh, is it clear or should I write I think this is this is what the crux of proper equilibria is, okay? So I, I'm not going to write it because it's almost similar to the definition of perfect equilibrium, but with this additional constraint, okay? That picking bad action should be epsilon times picking the next bad action. Any, any question on this? You're trembling your hands in a very specific manner in order to get to proper equilibrium. One property is that the perfect equilibrium in extensive form is not going to be equal to perfect equilibrium in normal form. Okay? Uh, this has been uh, observed in, uh, in examples. What that means is, if you're looking at an extensive form game and you're, you're assuming that players are going to tremble at all times, and I'm going to tremble at all times, and then I'm going to reduce the probability of trembling to zero, the equilibrium that you get, the perfect equilibrium that you get here, is not the same as if you remove if you move the, if you transform the game to a normal form, that is you consider all the pure strategies create this matrix, and you look at the perfect equilibrium of that game, it's not going to be, it's usually not going to be the same, okay? You can come up with examples where they are not the same. So there is this idea for extensive form games, which is known as quasi perfect equilibrium. Uh, and in this case, you assume, so each player assumes that at each time, assumes that others, that others will tremble but I will not. Okay, so player one is assuming that player two, player three, player four, all of them are going to tremble, but I'm not going to tremble in the future. So at every point of time, each player is assuming that others will tremble, I will not, 
okay? And then they take that trembling to go to zero, and they come up with uh, what is known as a quasi-perfect equilibrium. Okay, that's just a side, side information. We are not going to study it in detail in this class. But what I don't know, again I want to emphasize, what I don't know is whether any of these results will help you come up with an algorithm for solving uh, dynamic games, okay, or games in extensive form. So that's something you should think about. Will any of this idea help you come up with an algorithm or efficient algorithm, not for all classes of games, but for special subclasses of games that you might be looking at and might work for your particular case? your particular research. Okay. The next in line is persistent equilibrium. Oh, the other fact that I forgot to write, I mean, I didn't forget to write, I just, I said it in the class, that proper equilibrium is a subset of perfect equilibrium. This is a fact. So, of course, perfect equilibrium is a subset of Nash equilibrium, right? So, you are trying to refine the Nash equilibrium further and further, so as to find which equilibrium is the best equilibrium to play with. So, how do I define persistent equilibrium? So, there are a few definitions before I define persistent equilibrium. So, let's have two players. You can extend it to n players, so two players, and m, n, a, b, cost matrices. And I'm going to define uh, so let's see. We say that theta 1 cross theta 2, which is a subset of delta m cross delta n, is absorbing if and only if. So this is a definition. Is absorbing if and only if there exists epsilon greater than 0 such that for every sigma in uh, sigma You know, what I want to say is sigma should be epsilon away from the set. How many of you know what the distance between a set and a point is? Has, have any of you heard of that? What's the distance between a set D between X and the set C is? No? That's minimum of X minus Y y and c, right? So I want to say that sigma is epsilon away from theta 1 and theta 2. So sigma lies in the set of sigma in delta m cross delta n such that the distance between sigma and theta 1 cross theta 2 is less than epsilon. So for every sigma epsilon that is epsilon away or within the epsilon ball of this set theta 1 cross theta 2, there exists a row 
in theta such that rho i is argument of so rho 1 is argument of p over delta m p transpose a sigma 2 epsilon and rho 2 is argument over q in delta n of sigma 1 transpose b q. This is my best response, best response to sigma 1, sigma 2 epsilon and this is the best response to sigma 1 epsilon. Okay, so what is an absorbing set? <coughs> this is my delta M. This is my delta M. And this is my delta N. I look at a set inside this. So this is my theta 1. And this is my theta 2 okay and I pick a strategy sigma epsilon here so this is my sigma 1 epsilon and this is my sigma 2 epsilon okay this set is absorbing if for a strategy if player 1 chooses a strategy which is close to this set player 2 will have a best response here and if player 2 chooses is going to choose a strategy here which is close to theta 2 then player 1 will have a best response here okay so this is best response of player 1 and this is best response of player 2 okay so this is a this is known as an absorbing set Okay, so that's an absorbing set and a persistent persistent equilibrium is a minimal such set. Okay, so persistent, uh, you, uh, anyone knows what the idea of minimality is with respect to sets? So set A is minimal, A or, or in this case theta 1 cross theta 2 is minimal well let me just write it as a definition uh, is this idea clear can I erase this from the board uh, 
I want to define minimality, so definition theta 1 cross theta 2 is minimal minimal if there does not exist any theta 1 tilde cross theta 2 tilde is minimal absorbing absorbing set if there does not exist any other theta 1 tilde cross theta 2 tilde such that theta 1 tilde cross theta 2 tilde is a subset of theta 1 cross theta 2. I should make it a strict subset. Okay, so you can have multiple absorbing sets, okay, but you want to look at the minimal absorbing set, okay, which is such that you cannot find a smaller subset of absorbing set which lies within those sets themselves. And this is known as persistent retract. So if theta 1, theta 2 is a minimal absorbing set, then this is known as persistent retract and a persistent equilibrium is defined as the Nash equilibrium in persistent retract. Okay, so in the battle of the sexes, okay, any question on the, on the persistent equilibrium, the definition? You define an absorbing set, then you define the minimal absorbing set, which is known as persistent retract, and the, Nash, and the persistent equilibrium is the Nash equilibrium in the persistent retract. Okay, so any Nash equilibrium you can find in the persistent retract will be called persistent equilibrium, and the theorem is that there is one proper equilibrium which is also a persistent equilibrium. Okay, so in the set of persistent equilibrium, you will have at least one equilibrium that's also a proper equilibrium. What, yeah, so I wanted to cover the battle of the sexes example. So in that case, if you remember, the payoff matrix was 2, 0, 0, 1 and B was 1002, okay? And it has two pure strategy equilibrium. The pure strategy equilibrium is to go to the concert all the time or go to the football game all the time, okay? Those are the two pure strategy equilibrium. And then there is a mixed strategy equilibrium, P star, which is one third, no, two third and one third and then we have a Q star, which is one third and two third. Okay, so we have a mixed strategy equilibrium in this case, in the battle of the sexes, uh, that neutralizes the other player's payoff. Okay, so it becomes an equilibrium. And this equilibrium is not persistent. Okay, which kind of explains that why in these games people will always go to concerts. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, uh, but, but what I should say is going to concert is a persistent equilibrium. Going to football game is also a persistent equilibrium. Okay, so depending upon who dominates whom, <laughs> they'll go to either see the concert all the time or they'll go to see the football game all the time. But the strategy, which is mixed strategy, 
is not a persistent equilibrium. So this is not not persistent. Okay, so this is a further refinement of uh, Nash equilibria, and you know you can think of any game. Okay, whether it could be buying things from the market to uh, cyber security to designing spam filters. I don't know whether any of these ideas can be used or not because we don't know what the structure of the payoff matrices is, is going to be. Okay, but suppose you can come up with some structure to the payoff matrix. So for instance, you can say that the rank, it's a rank one game, okay, or it's a constant sum game, or it's a zero sum game, or it's a symmetric game, or something of that sort. Okay, you put some structure on the game because of some natural considerations. I don't know if any of these ideas that I've discussed in class will be able to help you come up with an algorithmic method to compute the equilibrium which is likely to be played in those games or not, okay? So that's something that's uh, TBD, that's something that uh, many of you would figure out or I'll try to figure out and we can keep writing papers about it for the next 20 years, okay? And we'll see whether any of these ideas will be used, uh, can be used for designing equilibrium, uh, designing algorithms for computing equilibrium or not. And the nice thing is suppose you use any of these ideas and you compute an equilibrium, that equilibrium will, will have that property, okay? So suppose you use this idea of persistent equilibrium to come up with a algorithm to compute a Nash equilibrium, you can say that this equilibrium is likely to be played because it's a persistent equilibrium, okay? It's not just any Nash equilibrium that may or may not be a stable equilibrium in some sense. Okay, any questions so far? No? So there is another idea called stable equilibrium and I'll just say the idea in brief uh, which is, uh, the, the idea is very simple. What is a stable equilibrium? Okay, let's uh, Let me idea M N A P as a Nash equilibrium. P star Q star, I have the same game but with slightly different cost matrices and I find the Nash equilibrium to be P tilde star Q tilde star. So we say that P star Q star is a stable equilibrium of this game. If you perturb the cost matrix a little bit, your equilibrium will not change much. Okay, so in some sense there is some sort of stability property that if I'm not able to estimate the cost matrix exactly, the best responses are not going to be very different, okay, from what it should be. So that's the stability property in some sense. So if, so if P star Q star is stable, equilibrium, if and only if uh, A tilde close to A, B tilde close to B implies P tilde star close to P star and Q tilde star close to Q star. Okay, that's a non-rigorous way of writing what a stable equilibrium is. And now, uh, the, the big thing is, using this idea, some researchers uh, showed 
that rank one games which has a plus b equals rank one matrix okay so that's what is rank one games so what researchers showed in 2010 that for rank one games where a plus b is a rank one matrix you can use this idea of stable equilibrium to identify a linear program or a convex program uh, to figure out a stable equilibrium of that game okay so that's the reason of going through this entire and this stable equilibrium idea is from 1986 okay persistent is I, I don't remember when persistent was proposed but stable is from 1986 and for rank one games they use this idea of stable equilibrium to come up with an algorithm that computes the stable equilibrium of the game okay and it's a linear time algorithm so it's one of the very and it's an exact algorithm so it's one of those or probably the only algorithm that solves a non-zero sum game non-trivial non-zero sum game so it's a rank one matrix game it solves that game exactly in linear time okay but if you make it rank two game there is no solution so far okay there is no algorithm that can compute the solution exactly in a linear linear uh, in linear time or oh, oh, sorry in polynomial time I don't mean linear time but in polynomial time okay so that's the reason why this class of ideas is important because it might help you think about algorithms for computing equilibrium in high dimensional spaces the other outcome of this study the study of stable equilibrium is uh, as follows and these are just results I'm saying it out loud without proof but it's it's good to know these things uh, so what's the result uh, Nash equilibrium strategies are finite uh, what I mean to say is Nash equilibrium strategies if you look at the set of Nash equilibrium strategies they are uh, within finite connected components in the entire set of strategies okay so what does that mean this is my delta m okay so Nash if you look at the set of Nash equilibrium in this particular uh, set you will only have a finite set of pockets where Nash equilibrium will lie okay so so that will be finite so you won't have and they, they will all be connected so you won't have something like an infinite number of Nash equilibrium of this type okay you can only have a finite number of connected components okay so it can't be something like you see what's the space of rational numbers in the space of real line right it's dense so you have you have infinite number of rational numbers in the space of real numbers but that's not going to be the case with Nash equilibrium okay they will lie within finite connected components finite number of connected components within the set and what this algorithm does is it figures out what is the stable set and then finds the Nash equilibrium within that set okay so that's that's the key idea we will study what the algorithm is uh, at some point of time when I cover algorithmic game theory uh, but but that's the key idea which is why I spend so much time on refinements of Nash equilibrium it's good to think about these ideas these are very fundamental ideas and sometimes it might give you some algorithmic framework to think about any any question okay then I'm done for today uh, next class we will talk about Stackelberg games <laughs>